the celebration of the divine liturgy. They didn't know what was going on. They just had hearsay. But it only makes sense that God, who took on flesh and dwelt among us, he didn't wave a wand and fix everything. He was very, shall we say, ontological. That is, incarnational. It had to work in this life. So he took on flesh and dwelt among us. Now, he couldn't give us his physical body, so he gave us himself in a way that we could receive him. So he gave us grapes and wine. We took and worked with those and changed them into, he gave us grapes and wheat, and we changed them into bread and wine. We offer those back to him, and then he blesses them. And they, we don't say transubstantiate, we say they mystically become the body and blood of Christ so that we can receive, we have a way to receive him into ourselves. So in the early, early church, they, their architecture really followed the structure of the synagogue. We have the holy of holies. We have the narthex, that transitionary from the world into the kingdom of God. And then we have the nave where the congregation sits. Now, in the early days, this was pillars, and you could see through the pillars, and on the pillars were icons. But with time, that those icons came down in between the pillars, and it closed in the Holy of Holies. And only ordained clergy are allowed in and out of the Holy Doors when we were in Greece. My young son, we were at a small church, and we were close. Everybody was kind of crowded around this great time in church. And, and he started to walk through the altar, and I reached out and I grabbed it just before. And I said to the priest, oh, thank God, he almost walked through the holy doors. He says, no worries. We make him a deacon and say, he's worthy. <laughs> <laughs> he's a little young. So here on the front of the holy doors, we have the icon of the Annunciation, and sometimes you'll have the four gospel writers. But what's significant here is that we have to the left of the Holy Doors is Virgin Mary in Christ as a child representing the Incarnation. To the right of the Holy Doors we have Christ as a, a grown man representing the Second Coming. So in between the Incarnation and the Second Coming we have the body of Christ, the Church. So he is its head, we are his hands and feet continuing the work of salvation, a ministry that he began of redemption. Uh, tomorrow you will hear, if you read the Gospel of the Crucifixion, uh, Christ will say, just before he expires, he will say, it is finished. What's he saying? It is finished. Is he saying, now I'm dying? No. He's not saying, I, I know the atonement theory that Anselm put forth in the 10th century about pain and debt uh, to the angry father is not something the early church believed. We understood him as doing something that we could not do for ourselves, that is conquering death. For any one of us to die, we're held by death. Why? Because death was for sin, for separation from God. But when Christ, the source of life, died on the cross, he was perfect. He did not sin. So the icon that you're holding in your hands, that's the resurrection icon, we call it the descent into Hades, shows Christ trampling the gates of hell. Death could not hold him. It had no right. He had not sinned. So when he says it is finished, what he's saying is my creation is now complete. That a human being has obeyed God perfectly. He did not resist. He knew that he would be crucified, and he submitted to the will of the Father that, that he would descend and conquer death. So what was completed, what was finished, was his creation. So now we, human nature, ascends to heaven and sits at the right hand of God. So in the Orthodox Church, we understand our role in life as theosis, that is, to become like God, to continue what Adam had begun and interrupted through his sin was we're created in his image, but our goal was to become like him, which is a dynamic process. And that is a process that never ends. So we have here Christ 
Virgin Mary, to the right of Christ we have St. John the Baptist, the last of the Old Testament prophets, and to the right of the Virgin Mary we have the church, uh, whoever the church is dedicated. In our case, it's St. Philothea, in this case, it's St. George. And this is in Stavro Nikita Monastery, and you'll see up here the icon of the Annunciation. So in the architecture of the church, there is, uh, there's hierarchy of where we put icons, and Dr. Sen probably explained this to you. Uh, we begin with the Annunciation. That's what initiated the salvation. And the Virgin Mary said yes to Christ. Okay? So, uh, on that upper registry would be the 12 major feast days of Christ, his life, uh, his death, his resurrection, and five of them, seven of them are dedicated to Christ, and five of them are dedicated to the Virgin Mary for her role in the conception of Christ. Okay? And this is in Osios Lucas, uh, just outside of Athens, Greece, and here again we have uh, Christ as a child, and this is uh, the altar area with Christ and the Virgin Mary. Now this is, uh, in, in, as I said earlier, is if we know our theology, if we know the stories of Christ, if we see the Old Testament as a prefiguration of the coming of Christ, then you can understand all kinds of things and you see the poetry and the relationships. Well, here we have, uh, we see Here's a man offering hospitality. Here's a man with a knife at his son's throat. We know without knowing Greek, we know this is the story of Isaac, sacrifice of Isaac. And, and Abraham was visited by three angels. Well, at the baptism of Christ, when we hear the voice of the Father, we see the descent of the Holy Spirit. For the first time, we understand God is three persons of one essence. So the iconography communicates that reality by depicting the three angels. And here is the Father. The three angels are of one essence, all sharing a red garment. But within the, the Trinity, there is, there's, there is unity, but there's also personality. The Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Father. And there's also hierarchy. The Son and the Holy Spirit are bowing in deference to the Father. Yes? It's a, yeah, it's an interpretation of that visitation of three angels as a manifestation of the Holy Trinity. Right. It is now, it's a, icons do a couple of things for the faithful. Back in the dark ages, middle ages, people, not everybody could read. But they could understand the theology of the church through the hymnography through uh, the preaching, through the reading of the Gospels, and through the iconography, that it was didactic. It could teach us the theology. So we see here uh, that Christ came into this world, and he's here shown in gray clothes in a tomb for telling us why he came into the world. We see uh, the ox and the ass recognize their master of prophecy, from Isaiah for telling that they would be the first to minister to Christ, to see the Creator. He came into a cave, the darkness of this world. You see Joseph set aside to the side with a look of despair on his face. He's saying, he's saying should I put her away quietly? He was disturbed. He was a righteous man. Um, so there's, sometimes there's a figure uh, in front of it, some say it's Satan, some say it's a shepherd, trying to plant doubts in his mind. And uh, we see the Virgin Mary looking this way. Well, normally, so the artist switched the scenes, so she'd be looking at Joseph, praying for Joseph that he wouldn't fall into temptation. Here we have Solomone and the midwife giving Christ a bath. Solomone was the daughter of Joseph. He was an elderly man, not, not the way we see him depicted in Hollywood movies as a strapping young man. Uh, we, we call the Virgin Mary the Ever Virgin Mary. You'll see on her helmet and on her shoulders three stars, Virgin before birth, during birth, and after birth. And if there's any question about that, fast forward to the crucifixion. On When Christ was on the cross, he assigned his mother 
to be looked after by John. John, behold your mother, mother, behold your son. In Jewish tradition, that would have been anathema if she had other children to go with someone else. But she was ever Virgin Mary. Joseph died, he was an elder man, he died, he was out of the picture, and it was uh, the Virgin Mary raising Christ. So, so that, that just kind of points to the fact that she had no other children. So Jesus was making sure she was taken care of. Here we have the visitation of the Magi, the star, the beast, the angels, the shepherds. So they tell us a story, not of one particular moment, but bringing all these events together to, to show us what was taking place, what was going on. So that's the didactic element. The aesthetic element is that you'll see here that the Byzantines followed reverse perspective. Now Giannini in the 14th century said, oh, finally we're done with those Byzantines. They knew nothing about perspective. Don't they know that we go back in space, like the railroad tracks, the telephone wire? Well, they knew a lot about perspective, and they were using it in a certain way. What happens when you break that plane and create the illusion of space? Well, it turns you into a spectator. You are watching something happen. But when they use reverse perspective and it comes out to you, you are a participant. So in our hymnography, we say, Christosianate Simon, Christ is born today. For us, for God, for everyone, it's a now moment. We are there. We are participants. Simon Christos Kremase Panotuxilo. He is hung upon the cross. So that whole idea that we're talking about before transcendent. How do we make those moments real? And not just a reenactment, re but we are really in God's presence. And we do it through the art of the church. We maintain the flatness of the two-dimensional plane, and we come out towards the viewer. And this is uh, an icon. You can see this from the street, from Aya Theodora, St. Theodora Monastery in Thessaloniki. You'll be walking by and you look up, and there's this beautiful icon, and it's of the second coming. You'll, you'll see later on a depiction of Christ with the Virgin Mary and St. John. Whenever you see that, that is a shorthand for saying the second coming of Christ. So we have the 12 gospel writers, uh, the 12 uh, apostles, the choir of angels, the river of fire, and uh, here's the, the saints and the monastics, and then here's what we call the ever-ready throne constantly prepared for the return of Christ with Adam and Eve. And we have the cross, the sponge, the spear, the tools of salvation with the gospel on the throne. Okay. Thank you. How much time do Until 7. Until 7. Okay. So uh, these are icons by my teacher, Costa Fotiades and Thessaloniki. Uh, after the Cretan period, in iconography, it ended about the 17th century. Iconography began to die out, and they would follow more a Renaissance style of painting. Poetius Contagu resurrected it single handedly and began studying, copying, uh, and, and, and giving a new appreciation for the power and the expressive meaning and theology of icons. And so now on every corner you'll find a little shop, someone's in their painting. We owe that to put this on here. Uh, there are three major styles, major periods of iconography, uh, three or four. It, it's not really about the artist. Uh, it's more about, what we call ourselves, the iconic servants of the church to make visible the invisible, to bring us into a relationship with God. So it doesn't change very fast or very often. That's not the point. Uh, it really it just reflects the time that you're living in. Okay. This shows what we would call a 14th century, 13th, 14th century Paleologan school named after the emperor Michael Paleologos. Okay. Uh, we do have a period when icons were not favored known as the iconoclastic period. And that was from Pope Leo the Emperor, the Assyrian. He was raised in a Muslim culture and he said, we don't have graven images. We don't have idols. So he outlawed icons, and that began the ikonomaki, the war against icons. Several people died, icons were burned. Uh, but it was two theologians. We had 
St. John of Damascus and St. Theodore the Stuart the Stuart, I mean, writing on the defense of icons, and what they said was that the second person took on flesh and dwelt among us, and he had a prosopon, he had a face. He limited himself to a body, and therefore we could see him and we could depict him. Uh, we don't worship, we worship only God. We don't worship images, we reverence them, just the way we anybody that we would respect if they walked in the room, we'd stand up out of respect. Doesn't mean we're worshiping them, we respect them. Um, just the way he pointed out that a, a piece of metal, a coin, has a value. It's just a piece of metal with an image stamped. But because the image is the emperor, the empire stands behind it. So the face is the hypostatic representation of the person, just the same way you all have pictures of your grandchildren, you love them. They love you, you're on their walls, you're on their, they're on their walls. Uh, it's the same way in the church. This is our family. We don't worship them, but we admire what they've done, their spiritual achievements. Okay? So this style is a very linear and very expressive period. And this is known as the Comignon period, 11th, 10th, 11th century. This is in Skopje and Fondele Monos, very beautiful icon. And what we are actually celebrating, this we'll celebrate tomorrow, the descent from the cross, the taking down of Christ from the cross. Okay? This is the entry in Jerusalem. We'll be celebrating this this Sunday, Palm Sunday for us. You celebrated it last Sunday. Okay? And this is in uh, Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, Istanbul. And that's what I was mentioning earlier, the shorthand meaning that this is about the second coming of Christ with the Virgin Mary and St. John. Okay. You'll see just how masterful and expressive this art form is because this is all what I'm saying, very beautifully done. Okay. And then uh, the, after the collapse of the Byzantine Empire in 1453, uh, it wasn't a safe place. They didn't have a need for iconographers, so they all fled, they went to Crete. Uh, they were under the sway of the Venetians, so we see Western elements begin to creep into the iconography, and uh, we see a, a, another major change in the uh, expressive uh, version of iconography. Okay. And this is uh, Saints George and Saint Demetrius in Stavropol Monastery on Mount Athos. Okay. These are Russian icon icons painted by Theophon the Greek, who was trained in, in Constantinople and went to uh, teach in Kiev, and he taught St. Andrei Rublyov, and that influenced their iconography for many years to come. You'll see their figures are very long and dramatic. The Byzantine figures were about uh, seven to eight heads high, so if you use your nose as a measurement, your head is four noses tall, and then your body is seven to eight heads tall, so we can draw just because we, this is coming from within us. We understand the human form and human measurement. Uh, they made theirs a little more dramatic. They followed the Byzantine nootropia way of thinking, but they made their figures more elongated and more dramatic. Okay. And this is by St. Andrea for St. Paul. We have an icon of St. Paul here on the altar. Okay. And uh, I'll just run through these quickly. These are portable icons. Now that you've learned a little bit about icons, you can appreciate the variety. And this uh, will just show you, and, uh, and I'll just take a few minutes just to demonstrate uh, how we paint icons. So let me move this over here. Could you quickly speak again? I, I might have missed it as to why why the picture of Christ in the garden is a religious painting, and how an icon is separate from. How do you make the distinction? Mainly, it would be the flatness of the surface, uh, because that one is more Renaissance and naturalistic. Mm -hmm. uh, but so so it's the manner in which it was painted and the way it is interacted with. Okay? So right now, I can only see two-dimensionally. I can only see what's on this plane. I can't see behind you. And I understand depth 
from the modeling of form, you'll see that we don't create shadows. There's no atmosphere in icons. Mm -hmm. So when you create atmosphere, you turn you into a spectator mm -hmm. rather than a dynamic interaction with the image. Can I say that? Yes, go ahead. I'm going to interject. Um, and another way of, besides the artistic way, but to understand it more in a teaching way, that um, in Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is, is realism. It's a depiction of a physical, real, you're showing what it really looks like. The icon will kind of show not just the physical aspect, it will show something transformed. So it doesn't look as real. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the message and the purpose is that is that we have this real physical world, but we also have a spiritual dimension. So the icon will, will communicate both a physical reality but also the transformed reality. Very often there's a halo, well, you see the halo is part of that communication. There is the, um, the eyes might be bigger, um, like Father, the saints won't be shown in profile, but Judas will at the Last Supper, because our face, our prosopon, the word for person or personhood in Greek is our face. So our face is our personhood. So all these sort of deep meanings are, are to show that we're just not physical beings. So the icon is trying to show that there's also this spiritual transformed reality. And that's what makes it a different, uh, um, I, and sometimes in Western Christian art, you'll see Christ on the cross in a very painful depiction, a very, gruesome depiction of the physical reality of what that was. In an icon of the crucifixion, Christ is almost floating, and as if he could step on that board and step down. So that, that the emphasis is not on that physical suffering, but on the offering of God himself to do this, and yet he's still in control, and he's still um, making that offer, offer freely. So it's what it's communicating. And the idea is that the artist is called on to capture not just his humanity, but his divinity as well. So we're not trying to get an ever more exact picture of Christ's physical body, but really we're trying to bring a, the contemporary person into a relationship with God. So that's why it changes according to the style of the time. Uh, because nowadays, when I try and paint a really expressive 11th, 12th century icon, people go, ah, it's just too much. They're not used to that expressive language. They're more naturalistic. So the last icon I showed of Christ in uh, Hagia Sophia is very realistic, very naturalistic. So in, in iconography, we're working with line and form. The line is what gives it energy and life, and the modeling of form is what makes it relational. So we begin all our drawings with line. Right? So I, every aspect of the drawing is worked out before we pick up a brush. And what we do is we use conventions. We're not trying to copy uh, nature, but we borrow from nature so that it is relational, so it is realistic. So we have conventions for creating folds. Okay, and, and it's, again, we're trying to create something rhythmic, we're not imprisoned by matter, but we don't reject it either, so we borrow from it. So that in the end, just as we put the grandmother bigger than everybody else and the dog on the roof, we're conveying the message, we're trying to take you someplace, to experience God, so that the viewer either glorifies God or falls down in repentance when they feel their God's presence trying to find that transcendent reality within the tools that we have, uh, that's the challenge. That's what we're after. So what I've done here is uh, I've, I've roughed out the shape of Christ and uh, just as, as jazz music gives us a feeling, it doesn't tell us about spring, it makes us feel spring. So I'm trying to make you feel a certain way using the tools of drawing and painting to help you transcend the physical and to experience the, uh, the spiritual. 
So what we've done here is I start with the background, I start with a drawing, and with line, and, and we start with a head. We say the head is like an egg, we divide it in half, we divide that in half, and then divide that in half. So there's the nose area. So the head is four noses tall. Disney figured this out. They do everything beautifully with circles. They have a formula. They have conventions for drawing. So if you follow these conventions, it will, they're like railroad tracks. Railroad tracks don't restrict the train from moving around. They give it the means to get around. So these are means to uh, draw and paint. El Greco was trained. Theotokopoulos was his name. El Greco was a uh, Cretan iconographer. And he was able to do things that were not from nature because he was trained. He could express. He could draw and paint expressively. So, so what happens is that, that if you've ever been to an Olin Mills, they use an ancient Byzantine technique. What do they do? They, they, they get you to sit and they turn slightly and look back at the camera. What's that do? It creates dynamism. It creates a relationship. We call it static movement. They change from a frontal position. If you're frontal and right in front of your face, it's very aggressive. So we back off a little turn and we look back at you. So wherever you go, the eyes follow you. So what I do is come right down the middle, but I put the nose slightly to one side. That turns the head. And then from within the eyes, we have the ears. And then that gives us the hair. Now up to now, this could be anybody. We can make it a man or a woman. But they said, they said everybody at I stood up and most of the church we were worshiping they had a testimony. They all look like cousins. <laughs> I said so that's because they use conventions. And I'm sure Dr. Sen told you about the different hairstyles of Christ. When they use the Pandakrathava style, when they use the uh, beardless Christ style. While you're drawing that father, I'll share a thought. Um, um, uh, when, let's say, a, an iconographer will paint an icon of the nativity of Christ, um, as an artist, you might be, you know, have an impersonal interpretation, but I cannot, a father of Christ, be able to say this better. Iconography will say that these are the elements that go in the icon. And you have to stick to those. For example, if you were to take the gospel account of the nativity of Christ and translate it into Chinese, you're not going to change the, the gospel account. You're just going to change the language. And that's sort of what an iconographer does. So the, this icon in your hand of the resurrection, also called the descent into Hades, every icon, iconographer will paint it with the same elements in it because that is the gospel. That is the message. And they're not going to change that message. They may use different colors or different forms or different um, expressive, uh, small, uh, smaller or greater expressive. So in this icon, you'll see Christ descending in a mandala. This actually is a little dark, but some of them are very bright. Um, breaking the gates of hell, shattering the chains and fetters. Um, Satan sometimes is depicted under the, I don't know if he is on this one. Sometimes under the doors you'll see a beaten and bound Satan. And he's grabbing the hands of the firstborn among the dead. And that will be consistent in all of these icons. And the firstborn among the dead are Adam. Adam. This is Adam and Eve. You see Adam and Eve? And then you'll see, yeah, thank you. And then you'll see um, on the left Old Testament figures who are awaiting the resurrection. They have died in historical time. So you see St. John the Baptist, King David, who else is there, Tom? Solomon? King David, and now one, I think it's Habakkuk and Daniel. Habakkuk and Daniel. Uh, in this case, now left, we have Old Testament, right, we have New Testament.